Okay, so we're back. Uh, again, I'm Karuna and I'm here with Delson. And as promised, we're gonna dive some more into the neuroscience in this episode. So one of the unique uh, possibilities of this day and age we live in is we can actually peer inside the brain or get a look at how it's changing through the practice of meditation. And we talked about how deep this practice can go. And now I understand, Delson, that there's been some cutting edge work done on your brain. So could you tell us a bit about what was the what was the study design and uh, what are they hoping to find? Yeah, so this study is basically uh, a two-pronged approach. There were two different research teams that were working together. So from what I understand, um, this is uh, from the University of Amsterdam and they are very interested in a couple of things. So I'll just give you a little backstory of how this whole research came into play and then what exactly that research involves. So this started off with uh, a very preliminary test with uh, the Muse device. And the Muse device is a consumer-based um, electrode uh, EEG uh, detector. So I tried that out and went into different stages of meditation and then gave my results uh, to David. And, uh, and this was given to some other people. And there was one person in particular who was in Amsterdam at the time and he met somebody he had not met for 30 years or in 30 years he hadn't met them and they were good friends and he found out that this person is now a researcher uh, I think he was in psychology and neuroscience and uh, he told him about this uh, preliminary research done with the Muse device and he was very interested in that and then they met with somebody else at the party that they met at who was a well-esteemed uh, researcher in the field of neuroscience. And uh, they contacted me, they contacted uh, Suttavada Foundation, and they said, is it possible to do further research with like, uh, you know, equipment that is medical grade and that can, that can really give much deeper analysis into the brain. So I was actually ready to go for that uh, in the beginning of well, I think it was spring of 2020, but it was delayed because of the pandemic and then things sort of started moving uh, in August and September. So while I was in the Netherlands, we spent uh, two different days doing the research. And this research is part of a larger study that talks about, uh, you know, what is the brain doing in these different states of meditation practice. And the first part of the research was what they call predictive modeling. And essentially what that is, is to see if the brain can recognize uh, certain patterns while in different states of either meditation or awareness. So the way they did it was they hooked me up to this, uh, I call it an octopus because it's all kinds of things, you know, coming out of it. It's like 64 electrodes uh, on the head. Uh, they had uh, a, 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 some kind of a watch that checked the temperature and skin conductivity, they had something else on the finger that checked for the blood oxygen levels. And they had some other sensors around my chest and in the back uh, to detect respiration rate and things like that. So the first part of the test was basically to just be in an open awareness with your eyes open, not really doing anything at all for the first 15 minutes. And that gave them sort of a baseline of what the brain looks like uh, just in a normal waking state. And then they had me look at some kind of uh, video, uh, like a documentary for 15 minutes, and then see what the brain is reacting or how the brain is reacting to that. Then they had me listen to certain sounds. Uh, so these sounds were like just vowels that were spoken by a male voice or a female voice, uh, and then some kind of pulsating sound. And the, the idea for them is that if the brain can sort of recognize those sounds when you get into Niroda. So the last part of the, uh, the study was to get into actual Niroda, into cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And they were going to be playing the sounds. Of course, while the mind was in Niroda, there was no recognition of what was happening. So 15 minutes later, they asked, uh, did you recognize anything? Were you able to hear anything? And I said, no, it was just 
an intention to go into Niroda, and then that was it. Could you just briefly explain Niroda? Yeah, so Niroda means cessation, and what we're talking about really is uh, Niroda Samapati, which is a state in which one can determine the time uh, for how long the mind would be in cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. The last time we were talking, we were talking about the different jhanas, and we're talking about how jhanas are levels of cessation, and then at the eighth jhana, there is an experience where you let go of the subtlest formations, and in doing so, there is a complete switching off the mind, as it were. So that means there's no awareness there. The only, no, the only way you know that you are in that state is when you come out of it, because then it's like, wow, what just happened? Like the mind was off for a while. Mm. But as you get more mastery over this, and as you get more in tune with how to get into Niroda, using a series of exercises for determining the way the mind gets into jhanas, and then finally gets into the cessation of perception and feeling and consciousness. And what happens is you're actually able to recognize just a few seconds prior to the attainment of Niroda. So it's like everything dials down in terms of the six sense bases and then it's switched off. And then when you come out, everything comes back up. Like so a computer shutting down and right, moving back up. Exactly. Exactly. But during that shutdown part where there's nothing there, there's no consciousness, there's no awareness present for you to be able to know what was happening in that state. So the only way you know is either just before or after that state. So what they were doing is it's that, that, that predictive modeling part of it is they were trying to look for how the brain, if at all, recognizes those same sounds it was listening to uh, in the waking state. So that was the first part of the, the research. While they were doing this, uh, they randomized the whole thing. So in the first phase, it was waking state, uh, then getting into a more focused kind of attention state, and then getting into Niroda. Then the second phase of that was again waking state, but instead then going into Niroda, and then a focused attention. So they just switched around to see what was happening. Uh, so that was the first day. The next day, uh, I had something like close to 90 sensors on the body. So it was again the 64 electrodes, the blood oxygen level on the finger. Uh, there were two of those. There was the temperature checker on the uh, watch. And then they had some other electrodes around the abdomen, the chest, and the back. And then another kind of belt that tested for you know any kind of movement or respiration rate. And, and the feet as well, they had some sensors to see if the feet would move around while asleep. And I'll get to what, what that was all about. And then they stuck something up my nose, which basically read if there was any breathing going on in, through the nose or through the mouth. Wow, you yeah. were a real lab rat. Exactly. I mean, if you see the photo, it's just basically that. I was a real lab rat. So, uh, so they had me sleep for the first phase of the, uh, the, the test. So this particular research was related to sleep and how the brain works during sleep and how is it different from the state of Niroda, from cessation. So they had me sleep for 90 minutes, um, testing, uh, well, basically examining and observing the different brain wave states that were happening during sleep. Now what's interesting is while the mind was asleep, there was awareness there. So that means the mind was lucid during the waking state it was lucid during the uh, light sleep state, it was lucid during the REM stage, and it was lucid during deep sleep. So when the researcher came in after the 90 minutes, they said, were well, you actually asleep? Because we could recognize that you were asleep, but there was this other part where it seemed like you were still awake. So the mindfulness was such that you could still be, let's say, alert while still in deep sleep. So that was the first phase. The second phase uh, was the Niroda phase. So they had me actually determine that the mind will go into Niroda for 90 minutes. So I did that, and uh, 90 minutes later, they all started coming into the room one by one and started asking all of these interesting questions. Because what happened was, at the 90-minute mark, the mind suddenly just came back up. So they must have seen something happening there you know, while they That's were amazing. reading that. Yeah. And they were, so, they were so intrigued by this whole process that they started asking all kinds of questions. 
and it became like an impromptu Dhamma talk, <laughs> you know, and they were all really listening very intently. Mm. And then one of the researchers decided they wanted to sign up for a retreat. <laughs> And you said they were kind of a little skeptical going into it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were definitely skeptical. I mean, the person that started with the research, uh, when he spoke with the other scientists, they were wondering, what is this? You know, maybe he's just going to sleep, and that's really all that's going on. Mm. Uh, so they were quite skeptical. But, the, but by the end of it, based on their, res, uh, you know, their responses, the end of uh, the 90-minute session, uh, they probably did see something that, that uh, made them very interested. Yeah, well, that'll be very interesting to see the results of that study when they come out. <laughs>